Okay, I'm Tim Clark, and this is Conversations About the Vietnam War, and my special guest today is Jim Simpson. Jim was a member mm -hmm. of the 611th Transport Company, and we're going to talk a little bit about a particular aspect of uh, what goes on in any large-scale military operations. Our issue uh, that we have to keep in mind is military logistics, which is basically the resupply of large-scale units in the field. So clearly, of course, in the simplest fashion, an army cannot fight without bullets, but it also cannot continue in the food uh, field without food, water, resupply, medical, and so forth. And so uh, clearly that's uh, part of the job a transportation company takes care of. So, Jim, uh, initially uh, you were a graduate of? Graduate of Camp Meridian High School in 1960. And uh, you were, among other things, an uh, uh, athlete, a uh, letterman there? And letterman in, in basketball and baseball. All three years, is that correct? Yep, all three years, yep. yep. All right. And then uh, uh, suddenly uh, uh, things began to heat up in the Cold War, concerns about mm -hmm. what was happening, particularly in Southeast Asia. And along the, uh, comes the draft that began in about 1962, and what happened? Well, after high school, I went to Olympic Junior College for two years, and I played basketball over there. And then I didn't go to school, and then I could say the draft board come along, and I got drafted in 1963. Okay. And uh, first phase of that is always basic. What happens there? I went from Seattle down to Fort Ord, California, for basic training down there. Okay. And uh, was that uh, six weeks? No, it's an eight-week basic training down there. Okay, and uh, then you have to go for more specialized training. Where'd you go? From uh, California, Fort Ord, I came up to Fort Lewis, Washington, and I was based up in Fort Lewis for about eight months before I got shipped overseas. Okay, now you said that in your training you also encountered something that you hadn't bumped into before. Could you explain what specialized training you were in? Well, when I left Fort Ord, I came up to Fort Lewis and we got into ration breakdown, which is handling rations to break down to distribute to the companies up on Fort Lewis. In other words, uh, you look at a company and you'd figure out if they got 150 people in it and you look at the chart and you'd go down the list of all the fruits, vegetables, meats, poultry, whatever items they had and you had have a chart that tells you you have 150 men in it and it would tell you the amount you need to distribute to all these warehouses or all the companies. So roughly a two-week uh, resupply? About a two-week period they would have enough food for it and then they would go through it again every uh, two well, months or so. Well, of course, every and they two, would yeah, have uh, changes in personnel and... Personnel changes, and but that was mainly how you distribute out. If you look at it, that's what we were involved in. So you're taking it from a main warehouse, warehouse. And distribution and putting it into a specific vehicle headed for a specific company. Yep, the trucks would load up and take it to what, which company they needed to go to, and every two weeks they would do that. All right. All right, then you did get assigned to Vietnam. So is that, uh, that when your assignment came through? Yes, I uh, got assigned to another company at Fort Lewis, and we didn't know exactly what was going on, but we waited around for about two or three weeks, and they told us, well, there's an airplane out there waiting for you. And so we got on a Matz airplane, and we were heading, I think we stopped in Hawaii just to refuel, and then about three quarters of the way over to Vietnam, they finally officially told us. We kind of figured it, but they didn't want anybody knowing where we were going, but that's where we ended up in Vietnam. Okay, uh, MATS is an acronym for? Military Transport Service, I guess it is, yeah. Military Air Transport, okay. Uh, you ended up arriving where in Vietnam? We landed at Tonsonu Air Base in Saigon um, and when we got over there, and uh, our company went over there, and what they did was when you're in a company, a big company, they don't want you all rotating at the same time, so we stayed there about uh, maybe four or five days, and they distributed the company up. One third went down to South Vietnam, one third went up north, and another third stayed there. And we got put into a new company. So they don't want every. That's how they officially did that. 
So we wouldn't all rotate out at one time. Right, because you have to have that experience. On, experience uh, mixed in with your group, yeah. Right, so people know what's going down. All right, uh, you then ended up at uh, Vung Tau, is that correct? Yeah, I ended up Vung Tau, which was an airfield about 50 or 60 miles south of Saigon. And right uh, along the Chow Sign to Sea. Okay, so, uh, and that's a redistribution center, is that correct? Yes. All right, so you're taking, uh, where's the primary source of your supplies coming from? We would have to need supply. We would have to fly up to Tonsonut Air Base up in uh, Saigon. And what kind of aircraft are you using? We flew in uh, helicopters, small helicopters, big CH-37s, and the Caribou airplanes. And we would pick up new supplies there, and then when we drop them down into uh, Den Long, Sock Train, in the Mekong Delta. All right, so you're basically a redistribution system. And yes. uh, what kind of bases are, are you resupplying? They're military bases down in the Mekong Delta, which uh, they supplied for the bases down there in the American uh, airfields, and they supported the Arvins down there in the Mekong Delta. All right, so the Republic of Vietnam forces are actually doing the fighting. You yeah, don't have well, mainline American forces at this stage. Yeah, at this stage, we were, the Americans were just more of support units and uh, handling supplies and military, all that stuff they needed down there. Okay. All right. Uh, in your locale at Vung Tau, uh, uh, you're near an area that sometimes is referred to as the China Beach area? Well, it's right on the South China Sea. And it's, it's, it's a, well, like I say, we're only like 10 miles or not even nine. We're just right along the bay, the sea there. All right. And uh, this is also an area which later on will become uh, a, a major R&R &R Yeah, Yeah. It, it after I left there, it, they made it an R&R &R center for the Vietnam guys up in north. And they needed R&R &R rest. They would send them down there. So uh, some of the pictures that you showed me uh, literally have you along the water line. But there also appears to be military establishments that are deserted there. Where did they come from? They were, the French were over there before the Americans were doing the fighting and they had a lot of French bunkers over there. And so they, uh, they were kind of old and, and just left there. So, so they were gun emplacements. Gun emplacements the, when, the, the, when French the French were over there. Yeah. Control everything yep. from piracy to black mm -hmm. market to whatnot. Okay. Uh, when you were located at Vang Tau, you mentioned that among other things, there seems to always be aircraft taking off. Yeah, the aircraft are taking off all hours of the day and night. But when I'm sleeping at night, I can hear them coming in and taking off. Now, are they all military transportation type aircraft? Are there any uh, support aircraft in there? There was a lot of those uh, fighter planes that were over there. Were they jets? Yeah, they were jets. Yeah, and they were. They would patrol the area too. And I don't. But and then a lot of helicopters would come in and transport the Arvins over to their, do the fighting there. All right, now helicopters are primarily flown by the U.S. Army? U.S. Army, yes. Okay, uh, the fighter jets, though, are not a part of the U.S. Army, is that correct? Yeah, I think they're uh, military or they're Air Force or something like that, right. Marines or... Okay, Air so, well, the, so the coordination of all that aircraft, you really, you, you got to know what's in the air because you got to have yeah. a safe arrival and departure. Uh, the, uh, the other thing you mentioned, of course, is security for the base. How did that system work? We had a, two perimeters. We had, the Americans were, had the inside perimeter and the Arvins had the outside perimeter. And we would have to pull guard duty. You know, I bet you I pulled it once a week. We would get in guard, guard towers, and they give us an M50 machine gun and our, carried our rifle with us. So, and we can see off in the distance. You can hear the mortars and stuff going way off there, and you can see the tracer sh shells going off out there too, way in the distance. But so yeah, that's when Americans weren't doing any fighting then, but they were just. So we, your, your job was just base security? Base and, security, yeah. And there was a space between the, the uh, two perimeters? Yeah, there was a space between the two perimeters, and that was kind of just for the military to... we take a Jeep patrol and just drive around the base in between the two so perimeters. So that was all night long, too? All night long, yep. Okay. Uh, 
you mentioned also, uh, by the very nature that you're in a combat zone, there's a difference in terms of pay scale. Yeah, pay scale, yeah, we were in a combat zone and they told us when we go flying that they would give us, you had to get so many flights in to get basic uh, mo extra money for that. And flight then they pay. said, well, you're over a, flying over a combat zone, we'll give you a combat pay plus some flight pay too for being in a, a combat zone. And, and did you end up getting fired at? I, my plane, when I'm on, we never did, but some of the other guys that went on the planes, they got back to the base and they found bullet holes in the, in the bottom of the plane. So, so, there, so was, it was there was a risk out there. Every time you fly, you never know. Okay, um, now uh, types of supplies that you typically were flying out or bringing back, what, what, what types of things are you dealing with? Mainly, it, it's uh, rotor blade. You know, the big rotor blades for the airplanes. They were uh, you needed those there for the, the main thing for helicopters, and, and all the small parts. Any kind of part that was broken down or they needed at our warehouse, they would uh, order it, and we would pick it up and deliver it to them. All right. So you're flying into the Mekong Delta. You're going into a smaller support base. Smaller base, yes. And those bases are actually literally uh, reinforcing the Arvin Army in the field. Field there, yeah. So uh, the, the nature of helicopter blades need to be replaced because... They get damaged or bullet holes in them and stuff like that. So we would have to uh, bring down new ones full, you know, take the old ones back and then we take them up to Saigon and drop them off at the, there. So how mechanized was this delivery system? Everything is pre-packaged? Uh, pretty, pretty much, pre yeah, pre-packaged, yes. But you're not getting any, uh, there's no loading vans, no uh, pitchfork uh, vehicles? No, it's mainly, when, when I was on it, we, it was all manual labor. We just grunt them off, grunt them on and go. Get out, of, get out of those airfields as fast as you can down south. All right, so the, the objective then is speed and efficiency. Speed and efficiency, yep. So it's touch down, unload. Touch down, load, and get out of there, yep. Okay. Uh, it, uh, in terms of how you dealt with specific uh, types of equipment that had to be shipped south, uh, uh, what kind of system did they employ? Uh, I need, besides the, the helicopter blades, I need uh, 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 wheels for the aircraft or whatever. How do, how do you locate that stuff on your base? Well, in our warehouse, we had a pretty good sized warehouse. So when the stuff would come into our warehouse, we would lot it in, we had bins. Some of the small bins are like this and then some of the bigger ones, but we'd have a, a number on it. So we lot it in and then they, they keep track of it in the office and then somebody would order a part and they say, okay, this part's in, in bin so-and-so. So we just go down the line until we find that bin number and, and pull the part and, and set all our supplies up in one area and when they get a load or whatever they got, there's so much stuff to take out and then we deliver it to them. All right, so if I need a front wheel for a caribou, it's in bin C123. Yeah, we had locations, yeah, just you go down. there and find it, yeah pull that out, and then that has to be loaded onto an aircraft headed for a specific base and, and renumbered for, for them uh, so they know exactly what it is when it comes out. Yeah, we'd, we'd have areas set aside for, for Van Long, Sock Train, or you just... Okay, so you're, you're, you're packaging a load until it's time, and then... And then when they get enough to take down, we'd fly down and uh, drop it off to them. Okay. Now, you're also uh, resupplying uh, some food in some of the areas? Yeah, on our air base, too. We have a you know, PX there. Sometimes we'd have to take go up to Saigon and uh, Tonsonut there, and we'd get on a big old truck, deuce and a half, and we'd drive down through town, you know, crowded streets, and we'd go down here and... Uh, get to the supply warehouse and pick up all the supplies back for our PX warehouse. All right, so that's a two and a half ton military yeah, truck? Yeah, they call it deuce and a half. It's an right. old, big old truck, you know. We go down through the streets there and we got to have the truck just piled up with food and take it back to the aircraft and we load it up by hand and haul, bring it back to the base. Okay. Uh, 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 you said also in your tour of duty there, uh, particularly when you were not specifically on duty on the base or on flights, that you learned something about uh, life in a foreign country. Can you give me an idea what that meant to you? Well, when, when I first got there, we went downtown and drove around the 
town there and the life was just completely different because there was a lot of the people that lived out of town didn't have any electricity and no running water and, and you'd just be driving down down there and you look out in the fields and these people are living in their little huts and all of a sudden you see people are just walking out in the fields and they didn't have any restrooms so they just wherever they needed to do they just went out and had to do their thing out there in, in the so yeah it's probably changed now but man it was well, a lot of things have changed. Changed, yeah, but, I know. But back but, then, it was. <laughs> yeah, but it's the concept that uh, there is city life and and Downtown. modern efficiencies and mm -hmm. and uh, uh, infrastructure that basically supports a, a modern urban life. And then there's life out there in the middle of nowhere. Nowhere. And once small... you get into towns, you're you're fine. But once you get out, boy, it's. Uh... Different, different story out there. So you're not going to find any hospitals out in the no. fishing village. No. So you're on your own if you cut yourself. Yeah. Uh, the uh, the other question I uh, uh, you brought some of the Vietnamese uh, money currency that you yeah. had. I had kept and, some of those for souvenirs. Yes. And they're uh, very unique in their style because mm -hmm. they naturally reflected the the uh, uh, national uh, uh, values on yes. the money system, but. Uh, uh, how did you acquire that type of money? I mean, if you're only on the base, then you're only spending American money. Is this is for uh, stuff in in towns? Yes, and we 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 would get off. We do our job from like seven or eight o'clock in the morning until about four in the afternoon or five. And when we're off duty, we can go downtown, do what we want. But we had to be back in by the gates close at twelve o'clock. So. If you didn't get in by 12 o'clock, you're stuck until 6 o'clock the next morning. <laughs> and I'm guessing you're on report for not having yeah. returned, and that's going to have consequences yeah. within the military. All right. Uh, the uh, idea of, of uh, uh, basically you had the weekends off for the most part? Most part we had the weekends off, yes. And, uh, Except so for if we had to pull guard duty or stuff like that, yes. Okay, so uh, 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 the people that you're working with are they mainly your age? Yeah, in the, you know, over there in our uh, barracks, yeah, there was uh, pretty much uh, except for the officers, there was older officers, but mainly the group I was with were younger guys in their twenties, you know. Okay, and uh, how many how many people in a in a typical barracks on one of these bases? Boy, it's. I, it's hard to remember now. I think probably had uh, maybe a hundred uh, in our group. I can't remember for sure, but it's and uh, and I'm assuming some of them are gone. No matter what time you're in there, yeah, that they're they they have duties or at other bases and 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 whatnot. Uh, did you find yourself outside of the Mekong Delta at any time? Any other flights that you took besides tents on that? Well, mainly no. Mainly we just, I we flew up to Tonsonude Air Base and then flew down the Mekong Delta to Van Long Sock Train, and that's sort of our regular supply route around there. Okay, and uh, so you were there roughly November of '64 to no, uh, November fall of '65. Yes. Right. All right. Uh, you're now rotated home. Where do you uh, do you, you get on a plane and you're headed back? Where are you going to show up? Yeah, they. Uh, I had my time was up. My two years was up exactly in November. So when I left Vietnam, I went down to uh, I think Travis Air Force Base in uh, California and processed out there. And they told me what I needed to give their clothes back or whatever. And they said, "Here's your papers, and you're on your way home." Now, did they give you a cash out at that time too to uh, uh, for your last uh, tour? I. Boy, I, I well, they took care. I think they did. They whatever time we had in, they either they sent it to me, and I can't remember. But they, they, uh, yeah. Okay. Well, I, what I'm getting at is, did you pay for your own transportation back? No, I think they they paid for it back. Okay. All right. So you arrived back in Kent. Yes. And what's going to happen then? Well, I came back from the Vietnam and. Uh, I just uh, went back to my my old job. I used to work down at the cannery in Kent years ago. That's when they did the valley processing of vegetables and fruits in Kent down there. So that's where I started to work down there. Uh, name of the company? Stokely Van Camp. Then that was it's changed names, but that was the old Stokely plant back in in the 60s. Okay. All right. Uh, 
anything else that you'd like our audience to know about uh, your education from being in Vietnam? Well, you, you learn a lot in the military. Military life is, uh, I mean, it's, we've had guys in there, you know, that get in the military and it's a discipline. You got to be, you know, follow the codes. And there's some guys that, but yeah, it's a good awakening for people. Boy, it's, it gets you in shape and you follow orders. And uh, you, so, I'm glad I went through that. So you understand unit discipline and unit why that's critical. Unit discipline and everybody has to do their thing. Otherwise, the chain, of, you know, the chain won't work right. <laughs> yeah. Things don't get done. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks so much for being with us, Jim. All right. Appreciate that very much. This is Jim Simpson, a graduate of Kent Meridian High School. And this has been a conversation about the Vietnam War. I'm your host, Tim Clark. Thank you so much for joining us.